Welcome. This is the October 5th Beehive call with uh, a lot of new guests. Chris, Sean, Greg, Alejandro, Andrew, regulars, Antrenig, Jan, and myself. Others will hopefully trickle in. And uh, as you can see on screen, hopefully, uh, Antrenig, like a long time in the making. I know with this large scientific system, you've seen that the CPU allocation on startup gets increasingly slow while you grow the number of vCPUs. I fi finally banged out a test that is linked here. I'll drop it in the chat, which simply looks at the number of CPUs on the host. It starts stepping through them with a tiny Occam BSD, oh, 100 meg image or so that simply has no auto boot delay and it immediately shuts down. So go ahead and try that possibly if that machine is not busy as we speak. And everyone, if it isn't clear, Colin Percival has done some amazing work on speeding up the FreeBSD boot time. However, as you'll see running this test, the shutdown time is uh, still remarkably slow and it's in fact the slowest part of this whole process. So Antrenig, I look forward to your results. So we have a number of guests from the Enterprise Working Group. And I will allow you to introduce yourselves because that group is news to me. Who would like to All start? All right, I, I'll start, I'll start. Um, and then uh, and then we can just go around. So, hey everybody, uh, my name's Greg. Uh, I have been working at the FreeBSD Foundation full-time since April. Uh, so I'm still really new to, uh, to this group to this community. Uh, I have been around open source for a pretty long time and I did some freelance work with the FreeBSD Foundation back in like 2019, I want to say 2019, 2020. Um, and so my my job, my title is Director of Partnerships and Research. And really like what that means is that uh, I am focused on uh, building connections with the downstream users of FreeBSD and um, understanding how they use FreeBSD, uh, you know, sort of how it can be improved for them, um, you know, working to, to make sure that they get involved upstream. Um, and then, you know, if there are barriers to getting involved upstream, try to knock those down. So that's kind of like broadly speaking, what I'm focused on. So uh, in the course of that work, um, I uh, exchanged some emails with a uh, a enterprise user of FreeBSD. And so when I when I say enterprise, I, there's a lot of different ways that that term can be interpreted, right? And it means a whole bunch of different things. So I don't mean like vendor, like I don't mean like say Cisco Talos or Storm Shield or uh, Juniper, right? Or NetApp where they, 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 they use FreeBSD as the sort of foundation either in whole or in part for a solution that they then sell, right? I, I kind of think of that as as different. That's like a vendor kind of thing, right? And they and those are relationships that I am working on and, and spending a lot of time with, right? But that's not what I mean by enterprise. What I mean by enterprise is like you are a sysadmin, a DevOps manager, a network administrator, um, at a uh, a, a company, right? Maybe that's American Airlines, maybe that's Marriott, maybe that's right some medium-sized company. Um, so in this case, uh, it was uh, Siemens, a division of Siemens. So Siemens is a massive German conglomerate, so a division thereof, where the systems administrator, network manager, uses FreeBSD as the general purpose operating system for their servers, right? So where, where you would more commonly see you know, a, a, a CentOS, a Red Hat Enterprise Linux and Ubuntu, something like that, right? Free, today, those are the more common uh, server uh, platforms that people use. So um, SUSE, yeah, 
Exactly. Right. So, but, but here, um, you know, uh, Michael uses FreeBSD. He's used FreeBSD for a really long time. He loves FreeBSD for a lot of the reasons why all of us love FreeBSD. Um, but for his use case as an enterprise, a general purpose enterprise server operating system, he's bumping into some limits. And um, that's where the enterprise working group came from. Uh, I said, sort of when, when Michael and I first started talking, I said, okay, thank you. He provided a very detailed, very, very detailed list of, uh, you know, um, areas where, uh, you know, he was hitting some limits. That, that was super helpful because it allowed me and, you know, others at the foundation to sort of sit down and go, okay, this gives us something to work with. Um, but but the enterprise working group didn't just spring out of nowhere. The first thing I did was I said, okay, who else is interested in this, right? And um, and there was a lot of people who raised their hands. About 55 people have uh, filled out the little interest form that I created. Uh, and we've now held three meetings. Um, and we are at the point where we are starting, we have, we have sort of gone through and added to the initial list of uh, areas that Michael expressed interest in, we added to them. Uh, Alan Jude is somebody who I'm sure many of you know was participated in those initial calls, and we added several of the items that he brought up. After that, we then prioritized those. So, which ones are the most, uh, you know, the, the ones that everybody feels are most important? Um, and then for those, we have started to organize around little project groups. So what, what brings us to this meeting is one of these areas is, is relates to Beehive and it's specifically around manageability. Um, so it isn't that there aren't great alternatives and solutions out there. It's that it's difficult sometimes to know, A, which one, if you're kind of relatively new, um, that, that you should be you know, using. And it would be really great if if there was one that was in base, um, and 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 that's about as far as we've gone. Right, is sort of identifying this as an area that the enterprise working group has identified as being something that we would love to work with the community around and see if it's an area where we can uh, make some progress. Because I think you know, across the board, everybody I talk to loves Beehive. It feels like it is a significant uh, competitive advantage for FreeBSD in terms of what it can do. And so if we can put just a teeny bit of polish on it and make it just a little easier for folks who, who are maybe a little new to it to quickly start putting it to use um, productively, I think that's sort of what we're aiming at. So. That is uh, all I wanted to say. Um, and then, uh, Michael, I can kick it back to you. It looks like a couple of folks have raised their hands in the chat. Um, so you can kind of decide as the MC if you want to do that first or you want to go to sure, the other uh, okay. new people. I do want introductions above all because people often, often have competing meetings and need to finish. So I want to respect <laughs> your time and everyone's time. I've got a thumbs up. up Let's briefly do introductions across the board with the new attendees, and I will explain briefly what these calls, well, how these calls have evolved since like 2018. So, because I, I see a whole bunch of overlap and a great segue. So, uh, Chris, you were pretty early on. Could you introduce yourself? Sure. So, um, first, I'm going to try to keep it short and um, and tell you a little bit about that person. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm born and raised in, in Austria and in Vienna, and I've got a technical background. I studied at the University of Technology in Vienna, but also at CUNY in the States. And um, um, I'm married, father of a six-year-old daughter, and my wife's Chinese, so let's say I've got some international family. And um, in terms of why I'm here, um, I've been working with FreeBSD probably back to, I think, version five or six. And um, somewhere around um, this summer, I think, actually last year, last year, I, I, uh, 2021, some, 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 some months, some years back, um, I was thinking I need to start also giving back to the FreeBSD community because I got so much out of it. And I started to become a voice maintainer first. And uh, when Greg approached me, uh, 
sometime in the summertime, I think, about this enterprise working group. I was very, very much interested, but also I, at the same time, I was uh, switching jobs. And initially, I really got into it because I figured I'm, uh, I'm interested in um, figuring out how I could connect uh, my, my business work, my, my daily job, basically, uh, to increase the visibility for FreeBSD as well. And um, during the first calls, and I, I actually I didn't attend the initial uh, founding uh, meeting, but uh, watching the recordings, I realized that this is not as much about marketing, but really, as Greg uh, already outlined, very much about fixing some things that are barriers for the enterprise. And um, at the same time, I realized that there was a spot open in uh, in one of the work streams, let's call, let's let's call it, uh, on this particular topic in regards to Beehive, and 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 my interpretation is also in terms of you know it's kind of like a, looking at a combined manager for Beehive and Shales, um, and whether that is feasible and makes sense. Yes, I know I think it's a completely different story, but um, I um, I. Um, also, at the same time, volunteering with, with PMI as a, as a governance officer, I'm a certified project manager, and I figured, hey, I, I, can, I can do this. Uh, so um, I reached out to Greg, and, um, and here I am, uh, hopeful to, um, to start working on this topic and, and, and move things forward. Yeah. So I, I just really started working on this uh, yesterday. I had my first call with, with Greg. Welcome. <laughs> cool. And uh, Sean? Unless you've got something going on in parallel, which I totally understand. It's now unmuted. Uh, let's uh, see. No we sound. We can hear you now. That may have been Jan. Uh, and Jan, you had your hand up. Do you have a quick one for one of our... Yes. Um, yes, go ahead. Regarding the manageability of Beehive, the big problem is that Beehive on its own is only without a wrapper usable for one-shot tests, you always need a parent process. Correct. For Hold that thought. To... Hold that thought. We, yes, uh, that's where, that's eyes on the prize. We'll get there, but let's get through the intros. <laughs> uh, and the thing I just posted demonstrates precisely that. So yeah, hold on, Jan. <laughs> uh, Sean M., are you available for an intro? Oh, did I get, yeah, okay. Uh, let's see, moving on, Alejandro, are you available to introduce yourself? Yes, sir. Um, oh, welcome. Um, actually, I'm here with Sean. Um, uh, apparently something's wrong with his mic. No worries. Um, so it was actually Sean that got me into FreeBSD, um, when I started working with him. And so it's been like a year and a half. I fell in love as soon as I started working with FreeBSD. Um, I do agree with the um, the Beehive manageability versus if you compare it to something else like KMU or anything else. And yeah, I'm excited to be here. And I had a few questions regarding some CPU stalls on, on Debian guests that I hope I I can ask you guys and get some, some answers. Thank you for having me. You've come to the right place. Uh, small note, your audio is kind of drifting in and out, but we could hear you. And uh, Sean, if that was an adequate co-intro, great. If not, let her rip. And no worries, while you get situated, uh, you are unmuted, but that's okay. I suspect a computer was involved. Uh, briefly about these calls, they started in 2018 as a continuation of the developer calls that were originally hosted by Peter Grian. Uh, Peter changed uh, from maintaining Beehive as official maintainer and then uh, left uh, to do his things, but he's still involved in various ways. So John Baldwin became the official maintainer along with Tico Nightingale. And I proposed to them that we resume the calls. And we did, in fact, resume a biweekly call, which was 
perfectly timed with oxide computing joining to produce uh, a, a solution that shipped not too long ago with Beehive inside of it that is on Illumos, which is fascinating. So FreeBSD is in fact upstream of Illumos in that regard. And the biweekly call drifted rapidly into say ZFS topics and other management topics. So I proposed a production users call. And so maybe 2018 also that sprouted the production user calls and they have continued to this minute. Uh, we have covered a lot of grounds and a lot of internals such as time counters and timekeeping in virtualized environments. And of course, ZFS topics and you name it. So that recently sprouted the jails production user and developer call. And that has resulted in uh, a roadmap I will show you. you. You mentioned your list of features and thank you, Dave, who you met in uh, Coimbra. He produced this spreadsheet of prioritized features exactly as you've described for Beehive. So who's after what, who wants to implement what, what would say unprivileged jail look like, et cetera, et cetera. So I will post that into the chat for your viewing pleasure, but uh, you can follow along with the jail uh, topics here. Those calls are following the same format. That's the jail calls. I can drop that in there. And then because we discussed so many open ZFS topics, this also sprouted a an open ZFS production users call, which takes place Wednesdays at 1 p.m. Pacific. So uh, I, it was remarkable to see what pent up almost tension there was around jail because it's such a powerful feature and it has not changed significantly. So people immediately, immediately launched in and was like, we need a state machine tracking. We need this, we need unprivileged, we need uh, better configuration management. So com in reference to what you're doing as a group, we are definitely looking at the nuts and bolts and the test I just produced for Entrenig is like, okay, uh, now that we have like, three digit CP uh, quantity CPU count systems. How long is the allocation time starting up? And someone mentioned a, an Ubuntu stall so we can get to that, but it's that type of stuff we've been addressing. Now, any tool like VM Beehive or anything up the stack will suffer from problems lower level in the stack. So we've been operating at the lowest levels. And I think the high vCPU count is thanks to nudging from these calls and testing and Rod's involvement, various folks. So uh, check out the minutes. Uh, that list, I, the spreadsheet I published, uh, pasted was from uh, Dave going through all of the minutes from the jail calls, but the jail calls aren't that old. The Beehive calls go back several more years. So stepping through and finding the issues, even tracking the PRs and open Reviews is a challenge. Uh, just in case it said getting code review reviewed has been a challenge from almost day one. And that's a little about what we've been doing. So for examples of who's here, uh, John uh, D with a large organization didn't join today, but Santiago, you are with NEC and you've been hitting various issues and been great about testing PRs and uh, reviews. So Santiago, if you're free, maybe do a quick intro. Uh, Santiago is also in Coimbra. He may have met, maybe he had a chance to talk, but he's very much a production user at a large organization and often struggling to keep FreeBSD around because for example, when recently the UEFI firmware broke Linux guests, he, for lack of a better term, got yelled at. And it's like, why the hell are you using the FreeBSD thing? It's like, why should a tiny update take out our Linux VMs? So things like that. Nontradig, you post a few things. Uh, hmm. Greg, I assume you one-to-one -one did a great intro with Antrenig when you chatted, but Antrenig, can you give a, a, a taste of what you're involved with, particularly with the university and your recent scientific work, which I will dig up here? Let's see. Sure thing. Uh, good day. I'm Antronic. Michael blames me for the jails calls. Uh, and uh, I've been working with FreeBSD for a uh, solid six years, I guess, and uh, playing around with it before. 
uh, my company, Illuria uh, Inc., uh, he builds a uh, software solution on top of FreeBSD. Uh, it's called uh, Profiler X, and we do honeypots on steroids. That's the marketing thing, at least, that we say. Uh, but internally, we use a lot of ZFS, a lot of DTrace, and a lot of jails. We don't use Beehive, unfortunately, uh, in the product, but we do use it a lot in the infrastructure. We try to do everything on the FreeBSD base level, or at least the ecosystem around FreeBSD, which is very unique. So Poudrier, Beehive, etc. Uh, somehow I ended up, and my team ended up working with the universities here in Armenia, uh, so we're building massive clusters, uh, well, not clusters, but rather massive single machines that has a lot of storage uh, and memory and uh, computing power for scientists uh, in order to do their computations. That's how my involvement got started with the enterprise working group. Uh, I, I, I came back to Greg last week with the bad news that we moved back to Linux because of the application layer. And uh, just today, we moved back to FreeBSD because of bad infrastructure of Linux. So we ended up moving back to FreeBSD for the infrastructure, as in it's running on the host. But now the, the scientists are running their applications inside the Beehive VM, uh, which got us into using Beehive a lot more now. Uh, I, I, I don't know if there are any other people who do three-digit three digit, uh, virtual CPUs in Beehive other than us, but I would love to know. So now our scientists have a Beehive guest that is using 240 cores on a 256 machine that's using uh, AMD uh, CPUs. Um, uh, and with a massive two terabytes of RAM, the Beehive we have was able to emulate one point eight terabytes of RAM for the scientists. They're running Ubuntu, but the host system is running FreeBSD. Uh, the the background of that is simple. Um, free uh, Linux's uh, Mega RAID uh, SAS drivers were awful, and FreeBSDs worked flawlessly. Um, so I. Don't know what the problem with the Linux one is. It's a very common driver, but uh, the the MR SAS, uh, as we call it on FreeBSD, works a lot better. Uh, with uh, doing a lot of work on uh, FreeBSD for the six week of the beta testing before moving to Linux, uh, we've actually wrote a whole uh, uh, wiki page of the details and a lot of examples for the scientific community. Uh, it's called Scientific BSD. Uh, which 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 has I mean if 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 a I want to say a mid level sysadmin reads that from our wiki page they should realize how there are types of features in FreeBSD that do actually lack in Linux that the scientific community needs things such as uh, proper visualization resource management uh, disk quotas doing the same thing on Linux has been a nightmare for for scientists and scientific uh, uh, operators. Uh, so that's that's how the situation is. And as of today, yes, we're we're actually running the Linux, a massive Linux on Beehive. And uh, I will report every week to see if there are any common problems that we see or not. But as of today and running a basic massive Java application in there, we didn't have any kind of problems yet. And uh, they seem to be happy with everything. I do have to point out that at the same time, we're documenting scientific needs on FreeBSD working with Linux. For example, I just finished documenting, um, setting up a basic uh, LDAP with uh, NISA style management, which is uh, which FreeBSD does have the documentation for. However, it's not documented on how to integrate with other operating systems such as Linux. So I'm also working on mixed environments, which might be very useful for other enterprise groups where they would like to have both Linux and FreeBSD running, but they don't know how to integrate things back and forth. Uh, and the, the, the scientific wiki page is uh, very much from uh, our jail calls, I would say. A lot of the features there is uh, mentioned by Jan, who apparently knows a lot about the internals of FreeBSD and all the links to the man pages. So this is as what we did late, lately. Thank you. So uh, yeah. Um... Antonig in chat pointed out that the jail calls in, well, they've resulted in commits that are in FreeBSD 14. However, uh, when we simply vocalize the fact that jail is an API to call, 
within a week or two, Entrenig had a Lua, FreeBSD Lua based front end proto proof of concept, simply because once you understand that perspective and relationship of all the components, he banged that right out. So uh, if you caught my talk in Coimbra, I, I sure hope that with the, the amazing OS that FreeBSD is, we have the plumbing for like CS201 to bang out those management systems every September, like clockwork and bang out these tools, but not in the way that we've all had this rite of passage of each running, writing our own jail manager at some time or beehive manager or dozens of beehive managers. So there's that. Um, any questions for Entrenigger or myself based on our intros a second ago? So I hope you've come to the right place. Uh, again, the minutes are great for summarizing, you know, how we got here. And I don't want Andrew, you to feel left out, but Andrew, Andrew has been a very loyal attendee of these and is using Beehive on OmniOS. So his feedback has been invaluable and the the two OSs have benefited one another, one another with be it CVEs, be it strategies. So uh, that said, was it uh, Chris, did we get, no, Sean, did you get your microphone working? Do, 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 do. If not, that's okay. So uh, for that quick taste, yeah, uh, uh, Antrenay, go ahead and run this little VM and script I've set up to just step through the vCPUs and, oh, Gary is calling, goodness. Uh, and segueing, you mentioned this large system. Antrenig, anything else to add on this particular yes. machine? Go ahead and yes. bang that in. So, you. Just, you've got the floor. Uh, j just to tell exactly what happened, uh, regardless of the guest operating system, if you set the CPU to an exact number, let's say 240, it will not boot. Uh, it, it, will, it will try to get 240 cores or threads, rather, from a single CPU, which will crash because the AMD machine that we have is two sockets, 64 cores each, which end up being 128 threads each. So ends up being 256 threads total. But when you specify the CPU sockets are two, the CPU cores for each socket is 60, the CPU threads for each core is two, then it totals up to 240, which is the first one, two, three, four, the first four lines of the configuration. Then it works exactly as you, as, as you would think it would. Uh, memory, we, I had no issue before figuring out the whole CPU thing. I set the CPU to 64, but gave it a terabyte of RAM or 1.8 terabyte of RAM. No issues with the memory visualization, with the, the, the DRAM visualization. Uh, but the CPU was a bit tricky, so you have to understand your topology of the of the host machine in order to do the proper way of the guest machine. Uh, performance wise, a basic benchmarking that I've done. I I mean I didn't feel any difference. Uh, I mean from you know uh, from a single core perspective, multi core uh, benchmarkings we still have to go on, and I'll I'll let you know on how that goes. The VM guest output there is from a free BSD VM guest from the live CD itself. Uh, for some reason, the Linux live CDs are always hard coded to 64. So if you boot a live Ubuntu and you look at the CPU and it says 64, don't worry, it's fine. Hmm. I, I got panicked the first time, but then folks in the IRC channel told me, no, no, live CDs tend not to use all the cores, just a single uh, socket for, at the beginning. Then they move to, you know, at the post installation, it will be, you know, seeing everything properly. But yeah, in the FreeBSD guest, everything is as expected. This is uh, an official release uh, and the memory and the hook CPUs all look properly. Um, haven't had an issue running FreeBSD with that much memory as well. Uh, Mar Mar Michael, the first thing that you asked me in our private chat was the boot time. The small size free BSDs usually boot around 20 seconds for me on this machine. Uh, on the uh, but th this massive configuration took me, I want to say, a solid minute and a half. You know, like I could easily uh, go back and forth, do look at some things until it booted, but it wasn't long enough to go and take coffee. Let's put it that way. 
Uh, however, Linux does take longer. For some reason, uh, Linux kernel 6.1.55, exactly the one that I'm using, it takes longer to boot. Uh, easily, maybe three to four minutes, it could take a lot longer for it to complete the booting. Especially if you have, this is more of uh, in, uh, Linux internals, uh, especially if you have any DramaFS. If you have any DramaFS, expect it to boot even a lot longer because it's like booting twice, basically, kind of. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's, that's how it looked like for us. Um, but yeah, other than the penalty of the boot time, if you have 240 cores, uh, it's, it's worth it. It, it works. And we didn't see any other issues on Beehive yet. That said, the script I just gave you will work mm -hmm. equally with a Linux VM. Yes. Um, and the, the Debian no cloud images are just fine for that. Just throw in a little whatever they do to have it instantly shut down. So just to boot it and shut it down. Yep, yeah. just loop it. And uh, please, any and all science you can produce out of that is appreciated because I know John Baldwin and Corvin were curious and I, I well, didn't have this test ready until this morning just before the call. So please let me know what you find and please do document the the socket thread count uh, issues you found because that is news. And in the broader picture, we all collectively haven't had this many cores to play with over the years. Yeah. So <laughs> this is new territory. Yes. Thank you, Grant. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, anything else related to that? Go ahead. Even insofar as I have a couple of machines that have lots of cores on them, um, we never assign that many to a single VM here. So we wouldn't, you know, even on our bigger machines, we don't encounter that kind of problem. What's the maximum number you do allocate? Maybe. Well, I mean, there were there are a couple of exceptional cases, and I don't remember those offhand. But I think typically two to four would be what what we'd usually allocate. That's a reasonable answer. We just are putting lots of VMs on one machine as our interest. So cool. And one quick thing to throw out there for Greg and company is that. If you talk to the Santiago's of the world, suddenly there are things that work really well on Intel, but not AMD. And we found that the AMD IOMNU may have some serious issues. Fortunately, that came up in Coimbra. It's on John Baldwin's radar, but that touches on, say, things like SRIOV and high-end NICs and a whole lot of uncharted territory. So I'm glad we're talking. Um, Does anyone Santiago, go? Did... Go ahead, Andrew. I was going to say, does anyone have any contacts at AMD to be able to talk to them about this? Because if they're having yeah. uh, I do. bugs in their IOMMU, they might yeah. want to know that. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I do. I mean, I we have a monthly call with them. Uh, so, I, I mean, please send me something, anything, uh, and I'll, I'll bring it up on our next one. Or I can bring it up before that. Um, so I can share some info, but oh, some yeah, Santiago I can share is some a production info. user in uh, a mix of Japan, Europe, and in between. Go ahead. No, yeah. So I can share some info, but then talking with I think it was John and also Mark, uh, they acknowledge that hey, the issue is expected because the IO MMU driver for AMD on FreeBSD is not there yet. So. I mean, they, they, I think the problem is more oh. on our side than on AMD, but it's always good to to tell them what we are seeing, yeah. Okay. Uh, Santiago, is this a ticket, I believe? Uh, I think there are a few, but are a few, that, that's, that's one for sure. Yeah, that's one. Okay. Yeah. So, for example, to answer your question, Greg, uh, that came up where, and frustratingly for Santiago, it's like, oh, solved it, and it works for like half a day, and... Then yeah. it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, you see. It's cruel. Rather. Okay. So. Okay. All right. Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I mean, it's funny because the, you know, this, this particular driver uh, is also something, you know, one of the things that's coming in uh, 14 is, um, you know, the, the sort of high core count support. Um, and AMD has been great, uh, in terms of supporting that, that work, okay. they provide us with a, yeah, like a, I forget how many cores the server has, but it was a lot. Um, but one of the things that is needed 
to make sure that that really works and you have all the same degree of tunability with it uh, at that high core count as you have with the under 255 is the IOMMU driver. So um, this is, it, yeah, this is something that we've talked to them about previously, but specifically as it relates to the high core count servers, but I, I'll absolutely bring it up um, on the next call. Related to that, has anyone heard from Anish Gupta, who was the NetApp AMD developer, who I believe left NetApp after being on the team with Peter and Neil? He might be invaluable if he's still involved. That's not a name but, I've heard. Um, Michael, read but, that uh, but, I, but I'm new, so <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. not, not surprising, right? Hey. Uh, so a niche, yeah. Yeah. That'd be cool. Okay, because it's like uh, an AMD specialist is invaluable in, this, in a situation like this. And For sure. all of that sort of perceived need has rapidly become urgent need <laughs> because people have uh, jumped into uh, Beehive. And uh, while this is not the time or place, but Andrew's organization was using VirtualBox on Illumos and someone thought, okay, I'm done with this. Even if Beehive is barely ready, we're going to move because it's too painful. And KVM was never quite right on, on Illumo. So they've been pushing those limits, working with the OmniOS developers, et cetera. Sean, I see you were in twice. Did you get audio working? Does my audio work now? Hello. Yes, it does. We can Welcome. Hear you. Yes. Yay. Relaunch the browser. Cool. Would you like to do an intro? For anything not covered by your colleagues? Uh, uh, not really. He pretty much covered it. Oh, okay. Are you working with a production user or a uh, foundation or someone else in between? No, no. We just work for a small company. Cool. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, great. So let's see. Greg, how can we make this most valuable to you? Jan started jumping into the fundamental issues. Jan is very good with exploring topics to their logical conclusions. Um, and but, beyond. Yeah. And beyond. <laughs> and, uh, I love it. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we love you, Jan. Uh, and notice he's he's responsible for some of our like four-hour recordings, but it's all good stuff. And, and I'm convinced that a a dev summit in person every three months where you sometimes forget what you discussed the first day on the second day uh, needs something like these calls to keep the momentum going, keep the follow-up going. And I think the results have been good. So I'm sticking oh, with cool. this model. So Greg, yeah. uh, well, your team is sure. here. How do we make this most valuable to you? Thanks. I mean, I think, you know, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll start, but then, you know, Christian, please, please jump in. Um, so, you know, Christian has has generously sort of raised his hand and said that he would use his project management PMI certified uh, skills to kind of organize this, right? And so I, I, my sense is, right, at this point, it's really, you know, collecting data, validating that, you know, the need that was initially surfaced uh, as part of the enterprise working group is is a broadly shared one, right? That and that the community would like to address, right? Um, and so you know we could we could do that in this call, but my my intention certainly was not to to sort of sort of join join a call and and sort of take over the agenda. So it might be better if. Um, you know anybody who would be sort of willing to provide their uh, perspective on beehive manageability and approaches to improving it would simply connect with Christian, um, and you know, and then Christian can kind of take it from there, right? And um, you know, because I think that's the stage we're in right now is just sort of collecting. Uh, feedback, and then the next step would be to create a um, a, a product requirements document, right? So uh, just a, a very, very lightweight kind of, you know, 
this is the way things are today. This is the challenges that that presents. This is how we would like it to be, right? Without sort of de- sort of stipulating any way to go from here to there just yet, but but rather, um, you know, really just sort of a consensus view of the desired future state is X, and and so I think to to do that, um, you know, the more people who are really experts with and have sort of firsthand experience managing Beehive and can really speak to, uh, you know, the, the the limits around manageability and some of the, the good alternatives would be, would be great. One small note from Jan and I, we've been jailing Beehive in various ways and that has uh, some security <laughs> benefits. And one benefit there is if we get it right and make it easy, suddenly the beehive management shifts over to jail management. The jail happens to be a traditional jail or a beehive jail. And that, do- that does somewhat follow the Illumos zones model into which a beehive VM is underneath a zone for both security purposes and management purposes. So mm-hmm. this, um, uh, go ahead, minor. Andrew. Yeah, please. It's not actually. Yeah, correct me. <laughs> it's it's not actually under a zone for security purposes, kind of thing. Oh, okay. It's using the same uh, interface to talk to it. So, you know, we've got this. Um, you know, we've got these tools for handling zones. We just also have a layer that lets us use the exact same commands with the exact same instructions for controlling Beehive. So I always try to correct that point whenever I hear it. So appreciated. And it does support the notion that if Beehive behaves uh, easily inside a jail, suddenly the problem is pushed to the jail team rather than the Beehive team. So so I I hope we're in agreement there that yes, let's, you know, when we can unify those things, let's do it because they're both very powerful tools. Um, yep. Other high and level I, thoughts? Go ahead. No, um, oh, Jan, one yes, one of you the had important some things is that uh, FreeBSD 14 coming out every day, any day now, um, has support for including common configuration snippets uh, using the new dot uh, include uh, syntax in jail.conf which allows you to uh, base, split up your big jail.conf into a parent jail.conf, which just includes the individual jail definitions, which can then each, if they want, include some complex integration into something. And this way you could kind of basically uh, include files similar to a C header, which you include from every Beehive jail, and then the Beehive jail is just uh, a definition of facts, like this is the ISO I want to install from, this many gigabytes of virtual memory, this many CPU counts in this topology, the storage devices, and then um, it um, it's really easy to ha- add the next one. And it's also easy to take this file and just include it and you don't have to write it all out. Yeah, so uh, for that basically, the new jail.conf becomes a way to encapsulate integrations. And going, oh, perhaps the exact opposite of where you wanna go, there are a lot of open PRs and abandoned efforts, and I won't blame anyone, but over the decade, uh, Beehive has had a bunch of interest and people doing, for example, oh, perfect example from the jails call. Uh, there was a GSOC project that finished in 2019 and it was approved and everyone celebrated and it sat in review with issues regarding its manual pages for what, three years? Uh, I reached out to the developer, I reached out to the mentor, I reached out to our group, and we found even, we had this great moment on a call where several of us (laughs) on the call are commenting, 
in 2019, like, this is great. Let's get it in there. Can we get it in FreeBSD 13? And I followed up. Can we get it in 14? And fortunately, it took that hands-on, like, hand-holding to get it pushed through, and it got pushed through. So if you do a quick search on PRs related to Beehive or reviews related to Beehive, we've had them some come and go uh, for years, often for want of relatively simple review. And yes, there's always a question of educating developers to pro to build a review that is a la carte components and perhaps separate reviews that are unified in one and you know making it easier for the reviewers. But uh, if you as a foundation have de uh, development resources specifically available to us, we'll gladly help you identify uh, top prioritized issues because that's kind of where this group has been operating because we have to, we have to get the plumbing right to allow that thousand flowers to bloom yeah. above it. So it would be really valuable to have someone with the time and implied authority to keep on poking people who are stuck in this um, review uh, process and just poke everyone with objections if they. Uh, if there is an update and they haven't responded in a reasonable time frame to an update, hey, is this done? Is your objection overcome by the change or did you just not have the time to respond? Are you fed up because it took so long and you don't want it? Do you still consider this as a problem? Uh, so yeah, having someone who can take the time and yeah, is acknowledged as being in the right position to um, keep hounding people would be really valuable to get things done, which are 80% or more finished and just need the review and integration and polishing to make them accessible and fit for the next release. There's a lot of good work being held back in Trajectory there. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, you know, I'm not like that's a little bit outside of my personal scope of responsibility at the foundation. Um, so I can't, you know, I can't speak to that like from like a place of responsibility. Uh, but what I can say is like we've had lots of conversations about this just in the short couple of months since I've been here. And, you know, it, it's, there's, there's always more things that we want to do as a foundation than there is money to do. That being said, one of the things that we've talked about that uh, is exactly to this point is a community manager that, and, 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 Jan, what you just described is like, I mean, that, you know, we have, I don't even think we've gotten as far as writing a job description yet. Maybe we have, but like, it wouldn't be, I don't think all that different from what you just said. So I would love to see that happen. Um, you know, and a big part, like what motivates me, like every single day to have the conversations with the commercial users of FreeBSD that I have to get them to become more involved in the community and to donate to the foundation is so that we can chip away at this backlog because there's a there's a there's a big backlog there's a big backlog of of there's just more stuff you know quite a bit more stuff that the foundation wants to do than there's money available to do it and you know I saw in the in the chat and I don't disagree like you know it would be really great if we could invest more in marketing marketing's incredibly expensive um so you know there there's a long list of things um but as far as i'm concerned personally greg wallace and again not speaking for the foundation because you know hiring a community manager is not you know that person would not work for me that would be a different part of the organization but personally that's a very high priority i see that as being hugely important Uh, do acknowledge the community managers that are already out there and not paid. Well, correct, right? I mean, for sure, and 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 that's you know, and that's part of the reason why I think it's it's you know valuable, right? Like the foundation, and I think this project in general 
approaches things in a very deliberate fashion, right? And so that means sometimes that like change happens slower than we would like, but but it also is important because it allows you to make sure that, yeah, this actually is a job that makes sense to have somebody at the foundation do versus so much of the amazing work that happens as it should in the community by volunteers, right? That That's what differentiates FreeBSD in my mind from so many of the other projects that I've worked for is the community uh, aspect of it um, and the volunteer aspect of it. So, uh, so anyway, yeah, I agree completely, Michael. And it's a, it's a very good point. Uh, because various folks have been filling vacuums because the vacuums are there. So that's just totally nature. Uh, and yeah, yeah. in no way can I fault John Baldwin or Mark Johnson for the amazing work they do. And they're, you know, when you see them do a commit fixing an obscure, obscure potential security issue that I forgot who is doing those reports, but it's amazing work that just won't happen organically. It takes that, that, that deliberate <laughs> pursuit of it so yeah there's an intro of what we're, we're up to maybe drop into a few of the recordings of these scroll through the document to see what's there uh nearly every beehive user is a zfs user so the venn diagram quickly becomes well you know we've got zfs doing the heavy lifting that other os's beyond the lumos aren't doing We've got Dtrace because that allows you to inspect this whole stack. We've got great networking. We've got uh, reason, rather good support for the hardware devices you want to have. FreeBSD is often terrible with terrible hardware, and I'm not losing sleep over that fact. So having even just this like this yesterday, Antonig see that the LSI Broadcom card is problematic on Linux, and he sent me some of the output errors and such. But it works just fine on FreeBSD. Well, that you know, hats off. That's great work to all those making that happen. So I, on that very point, will say relationships with organizations like Broadcom, LSI, Avago, whichever name you want to use of the week, and the and and Chelsea especially, it is critical that FreeBSD keep making those components shine because it can actually deliver on their promises. But if we were to lose support for FreeBSD on them, it would be most unpleasant in storage circles because we live and die by those components. So thank you for your work engaging with those partners. And of course, if you want to geek out on IOMMUs, there's that. Um, anyway, um, we've opened a wonderful can of worms. Uh, if you want participation from anyone here on enterprise user calls, just reach out. Uh, this, these are wide open. Anyone's invited. Uh, as for uh, you, you know, hijacking the agenda, that's purely out of respect for your time and the fact <laughs> that you might have to well, jump you, off on other meetings. But well, you're very kind. I appreciate it. Yeah. Sure. And developers generally get priority if there's a topic, but we will at, explore a topic often over months until it's set. And uh, Feel free to confirm that through the recordings. Um, for example, getting to management, sure, I'll just throw this out there. Uh, Wi-Fi box is a very cool workaround to use a VM to use wireless hardware that is not supported in FreeBSD. So it takes that hardware, drops it into a Linux VM, bridges it out to the host, and is a very clever use of of all the components, and I cannot forget, uh, if you have not seen it, let me see, Jason Tubner, Beehive in 60 Days, I believe it was. It is a Beehive Con talk, it is a BSD Can talk, Asia BSD Con, but if you have not seen it, please absolutely check this out. I will find a link to it right now, because it is one of the greatest success stories and early success stories of Beehive in production in the wild. And I'll, I'll just tell it to your team because uh, Beehive 60 days. So it stopped me if you've seen it or heard it. If not, I'll give you the quick rundown. Uh, Jason Tumpnor. So uh, Jason is with the Social Services of Australia. 
They obviously have a limited budget and data centers, which are often a tin shed in the middle of the outback. So uh, they had been using VMware and the performance was kind of terrible. And so, and of course the licensing, of course, a whole lot of factors and ZFS, what's that? I'm posting the link there. Take a look when you have a chance. So he's out of IBM. He's a Unix person. He's like, okay, well, I love OpenBSD. I love FreeBSD. I have to get this support Windows printer supply level notifications. So what he does is take Beehive on Lenovo systems. He under FreeBSD Beehive runs open BSD for the IPsec VPN to all of his different locations because being government, they kind of need that to be working and secure. Uh, at the locations, he runs a Windows VM to get that information on the printer levels and report back. And this has worked very well. He worked very closely with Peter Green, Beehive, one of the key developers regarding, well, Windows support issues and getting it optimal. So Jason's work was proof that we're onto something and proof to the point I just made on Wi-Fi box that there is no one solution. You want to find the best components available and bring them together. So what Wi-Fi box does is use a Alpine Linux minimum VM with proper genuine drivers for a card you don't have good support for, even is using 9P, the Vert IOFS, which you'll see I put years into trying to get that going. And hopefully the, the review makes it in time for 14 to get the client working. So you can have like block device list VMs not using NFS on FreeBSD. Uh, so uh, Jan, they are using Daemon to manage things, but I think they got it wrong. They call the script with Daemon. And then if you send a signal to kill the VM, it actually kills the parent script rather than the VM. And I don't think they passed. Um, Daemon can that. write a PID file for itself and a okay. different PID file for uh, the uh, child process. Okay. And so they're flex. And you still have to have something running as a child of daemon. So the process tree at one time would look like the daemon wrapper command, a shell script, and then beehive. The shell script is needed because the daemon command in base can't do the exit uh, status uh, dispatching to tell the four, four or three and the catastrophic state basically apart. Okay. Because... Yep. Uh, as documented in the Beehive man page, uh, the exit status indicates what happened. If it hit a b really bad bug, it okay, it crashed with a random code. But the other ones are the guest requests to be restarted because it wanted to perform a software reboot. Uh, it has uh, requested to be halted. So yep. don't restart it, but also don't destroy the state. Uh, it wants to be shut down and stay down or... Um, it encountered a triple fault, uh, yeah. And okay. if you want to unpack that, uh, if you install Wi-Fi box, go and there is a core. Maybe take a look at the script, and you'll see how they're handling it. I yeah. did my best to unpack that yesterday. And but it looks like they do run this Beehive Box VM manager under a daemon from the invocation. Yeah, and this is yeah exactly. It's daemon called. So there this. is something running oh, as a child, which is fine. That's what you have to do if you do it with daemon and shell. It's probably uh, worth noting yep. noting that you guys aren't the only guys to do this type of thing. Of course. This not. is this is how this is what you're describing is exactly what the SCL4 guys do for all of their drivers initially before they port them. They just spin up a Linux VM and go into that. Interesting. Uh SCL4 remind us all what that is. Uh it's a microkernel. Okay. Um, secu very security oriented. So, you know, they'll 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 run a Linux VM, use that for the driver support until they write their own, uh, actually formally verified drivers. That's that their big claim to fame is that they formally uh, verified their um, kernel. Under Beehive or KVM or something else. Uh, they will run the Linux kernel as a user mode process. 
on the on oh, okay. just cool. They just started up as any other program. Similar to user mode Linux or the old MK Linux for PowerPC. Probably. I haven't heard MK Linux in decades. A very so. long time. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, a slow but cheap way to reuse a Mac port for PowerPC to get Linux running without having to teach it all about the intricacies of IBM and Apple hardware. Yeah, I like I said, I I have heard it. I've messed with it. I just haven't heard it in decades. Uh, so the 9P client review has getting some movement, but not perhaps enough to really get it wrapped up for 14. Just for your team, Greg, it is eyes on the prize to have no block devices like a big old Z-Wall or something to do a VM. Uh, I raised the money to get the server in Beehive and Juniper has produced the basic client, but they've been a bit slow. So someone recently jumped in and polished it up. And then Juniper, after that, published their code, which hopefully isn't too different from the previous dump of it. And I hope that is on someone's broader radar, because that's so, one where you can go see my talk on untangling and the stack of that we, the storage stack we have for virtual machines, which is nothing but trouble from a support perspective. Was that you, Jan? Yes, uh, the important part is that it allows what in virtual box or QEMO would be called a, a shared directory, which if you fully support it, can provide POSIX semantics, which NFS doesn't, and without requiring any networking to be configured between guest and kernel, so that you can share something which is writable by the guest end the um, host at the same time, which normal file system can't be. If I'm not mistaken, Windows WSL Weasel supports this, and that's how they have a Linux user land at the at your fingertips yes. on Windows. So this is taking place every minute of every day, and it has great benefits. Let's get it working. And in the big picture, there may even be a need for a, a native ZFS vert IOFS, such that your data set is just pass through a different mechanism to a VM, but that's eyes on the prize. Let's get there through these baby steps. Safely not. 9P does have an extension mechanism. And yes, there are several revisions of it. Uh, safely, safely. So that said, uh, Access the same data. I'm trying to move as quick as I can. So uh, we don't have John W for an update. John D, DW, actually. Uh, Santiago, any movement on your tickets? Or we're, we've pretty much identified the issue as being IOMMU, and that's where it's at. We need to look at it from a development perspective rather than a compliance perspective. I haven't had any time, to be honest, since we came back from Coimbra. My schedule is a mess. So, yeah, trying to catch up. I guess the same as everyone. So. Understood. Understood. Yeah. Okay. Um, and Antonig is away from keyboard. Well, Greg, I hope that was indeed useful as a, an intro. If I hear you correctly, our action item is to uh, portray and vocalize what we see management looking like. Because if it's not obvious, this group is often in the weeds. <laughs> we we, we, I, we I, imagine I those nice things. Um, <laughs> because I just also I uh, I just chatted back and forth with Greg on um, uh, the uh, particular topic that is coming out of the uh, enterprise uh, working group. Yeah. Um, I would love to organize a separate call um, to, you know, collect and discuss uh, the thoughts on building some 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 sort of management utility, basically, or or, or whatever is desired. Um, the original concept or the original idea that spawned off this this work stream, 
I think was kind of a mixture between managing Beehive and JLs, um, and I just reread uh, the, the the input. Um, originally, I was thinking, okay, um, that uh, the, the originator actually was thinking of something that would be doing both, but I think that doesn't really make much sense. And um, for obvious reasons, whatever is being drafted in terms of Beehive or JLs would always be a, a, a it would always be seeking a balance between um, uh, comfort and, and and lowering complexity versus uh, you know capabilities because at the end of the day, uh, Beehive and configuring Beehive correctly is complicated because it is so powerful, and um, and um, I guess we'll have to figure out the scope first, as as uh, Greg already said, and putting that into the requirements uh, or this, this product requirements document, I think is a is a very good approach. Um, and I expect that this will take a couple of conversations um, to to figure out really. And um, because of the fact, you know, everyone has different schedules, I was figuring, okay, maybe maybe I'm going to organize a couple of calls and then come back to you guys uh, maybe uh, in this setting and, and uh, yeah, gain present and gain additional feedback um, if that is okay. Are your design docs to date available and perhaps recordings of your meetings so that we can catch ourselves up? I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy to. I mean, there has not been any meeting yet. We have a we have a draft. I don't know, uh, Greg. Is the is the document public? Um, there's a right. Um, yeah. Workspace so that we can share. Yeah. Um, I have to look and see how I haven't. All I've done so far with Rike, with Rike is just the project management software that I'm using, um, and I. I don't know if it has the ability to like set a task to public. Um, I'll have to look at that. But the the PRD is like is absolutely public, but it's like not even really started yet, <laughs> right? Like I think that the, really it's, at it's, the beginning. You know, yeah, we're really at the beginning. the The enterprise working group calls are uh, absolutely recorded. The first two are available on the FreeBSD Foundation YouTube channel, um, wow. which I can uh, I can Good just grab. Can. Yeah, I'll, that's one of the ground rules like, on these calls is like have your ring links ready. So if you found some really cool thing this week, be ready with it because we're probably in agreement that it's cool. Uh, so yeah, if you've got so like, those, great. But yeah, I'll, I'll share those. And, but but just you know, bear in mind that like we're we're covering eight or nine different sort of areas that are of interest uh, okay. to the enterprise. So we're covering cloud native and, you know, an uh, OCI runtime. We're covering, you know, NVIDIA GPU uh, graphic drivers for AI workloads. We're covering, I mean, you know, Active Directory DNS integration, right? Like, so Beehive and man the manageability of Beehive is, is like one of the 12 ish things that we're that we're going over so i just want to make sure that everybody knows that like if of course if you go on the recording like don't expect it to be all about beehive it's it's mostly okay. not um well yeah that's why we're here today for specifically beehive and oci was covered quite heavily yesterday on the jail call so that oh, okay. may be interest to you yeah um, oh yeah. that's the cool Venn yeah i wish it's I... like amorphous blurry and crazy and the recording's up from yeah. yesterday all right all yeah it's it's such a fascinating area, and and there's several folks who are involved in the enterprise working group who have volunteered to help with the development, right? So you know, there's there's so many really, um, uh, you know, promising approaches, uh, and we, you know, and I think we want to, you know, I think we have an opportunity right now to you know, put some thought into, okay, what's a good phase one, right? We're not excluding anything, but like if we had to pick, right? If what we wanted to do was say, you know, this is the end state that we'd like to arrive at, which of these approaches is the shortest path to get us there? And then let's coordinate our efforts to, to get that one, right? Um, 
as far along as quickly as we possibly can, because I definitely see an opportunity right now uh, with the way that there is really great standardization happening around cloud native. There's every opportunity for FreeBSD to uh, be a, um, you know, first, a tier one platform for cloud native, right? Whereas even though Jails has always been fantastic and it's always provided a lot of great capabilities, you know, when Docker came along and, it, and we, we kind of got closed out. Um, it, I'd say so, we're to blame. I think Jail had this lovely best kept secret status, which is not helpful in industry. So yeah, we all yeah, proudly smugly you know. used it in our corners, but then the rest of the world's yeah. like, well, let's solve these problems. Yeah. Badly. No, that's true, but like so, water under the bridge. Yeah, like I true. think now we're at a place where like we can we can we can we can sort of learn that lesson and prevent it from happening this time around. And so, amen. amen. Um, so you know, like uh, that's that's cool to hear. And and um, you know, and and I'm just glad to be connected with this group. And I I intend to join the jails call as soon as I can. Um, Understood. So that I can just listen. And then reflect back to that expert group, you know, the the thinking that's happening. Because really think of like the enterprise working group as sort of like an end user group, right? So these are people who are, you know, okay, this is kind of, so it's it's input to the development process. It's like, this is what I, you know, for me as an end user, it would be great if I could have this um type of thing. So uh, but I, I got distracted and now I'm not looking for the videos. <laughs> Uh, John, I understand you have an extremely concise description <laughs> of the fundamental differences in managing.